Um, none of this would be possible without the executive producer and creator, Tanya Saracho. Hi, darling. And then next up, coming from Power and Black Sales and Sacred Lies on Facebook, she's been with the show from the start. Welcome staff writer Jennifer Gomez. And our next panelist, she came in in season two and comes from the world of Sons of Anarchy, Star, and Dynasty. Welcome co-producer Gladys Rodriguez. <laughs> Welcome, Gladys. Anyway, we're, we're That's very like cozy. Reina, you know, status. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I feel like I should be, ask, be asking the questions. Yeah. Me and Jim. <laughs> well, a lot of people clapped when they saw my T-shirt. Can we talk about it real quick? And yes. just this was a, I think it was la was it last summer? Yeah, we started this initiative one beat at a time as a response to what's been going on at the borders, um, and you know, we just wanted to bring awareness to it. We have this platform that we wanted to use, and we were the only two. Latinx shows, One Vida at a Time and Vida. One day. Uh, one day at a time <laughs> then, and Vida. And, um, you know, we just wanted to do something. We felt so helpless and we wanted to do, just rally together and bring awareness. And so we used the hashtag One Vida at a Time to challenge shows, TV shows and writer's rooms to um, take pictures and kind of just bring awareness to the cause. And we had over 100 shows at the end. 99. 99 shows. <laughs> you need one more. Who's in the audience? I know. <laughs> that participated. And it was so awesome just to see the support that we got in Hollywood and just to bring awareness. And even Raices, who is the um, organization behind you know, everything that's been going, been going on right now, they came to our writer's room and spoke to us. And you know, I felt like this is like, our way of like doing something and giving back, even if it's this little thing that we just did to bring awareness. But it was really awesome, and we we're glad that people kind of participated. So, yeah. So I had to wear my shirt. I had yes. to. Yes. Yes. Um, congratulations, first of all. The show got a third season last week. <laughs> Thank God. Because for those of you who have watched the whole second season, like it could not end there. Like there's so much more. So I'm personally excited. Um, but t tell me, you know, we're here to talk about the writers' room, and you know, when the show, when you were just getting the show off the ground before it was even on the air or anything, what what was that process like for you? Kind of ha having been in staff rooms before and knowing that process, knowing what worked for you, what didn't work for you. How did you kind of start that, and how did that change for season two? Um, so not how the genesis of like that starts pitch me, but like how I chose the participants. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think a key and. Um, <laughs> Um, Allison says that this is a drinking game every time I mention Marta Fernandez. Um, Marta Fernandez is the executive that sort of helped sh uh, shepherd and greenlight, um, help greenlight um, uh, the show. And I think her last name tells you everything, you know, that uh, she's Marta Fernandez. So there was a lot of yeses that I got that maybe other uh, creator, showrunner, executive producers would not have gotten. So when, when it was time to staff the room, there was never a no about like it being all Latinx. In fact, she already had a list ready for me when I went, like I even went ready for like a fight, right? Cause like, cause it hadn't, I thought hadn't been done before. Um, and when I got there, um, she just was ready with it. Was, yeah, it was, that makes sense, she said. So the fact that I didn't have to pitch it or defend it, it was just, and the same thing with directors. All my directors this season, first season, they're all Latinx. This season, they're all Latina. And that, um, it's, that's really, it really, because you know, you have to give a lot of first shots to people. And that's not just opening the door, it's also committing to mentoring and supporting. So it takes extra energy, so maybe that's why people don't want to do it sometimes, but you know, the, like, the mission of Vida is as important as you know the entertainment we produce. The way we make it is as important as what we're making. So, um, but it was it was that it was um, yeses for that, those kinds of things, and that really makes up like the like the the chemistry of how you put something like this together. When they say yes, we'll help we find a Latina cinematographer, then you are securing that the eyes are right, you know. Because so, and then yes, you'll have all female editors. 
it, that's super important. We're, like we're at every stage, all our department heads are female. Like you, it, it matters, you know? Like especially when you're doing these intimate sex scenes um, and there's all females in the room putting them together, our first AD, our second AD, you know? Um, and that doesn't happen a lot. So like it, I think uh, the way we're making it is, um, and not just because it's mine, but it's pretty special, <laughs> you know? <laughs> were you pinching yourself through all this? Just the fact that it was, Tanya, what, oh, all of you, were you, I'll pinch on yourself the way the process was, I mean, I'm not, it's never easy, but the fact that you were getting all the yeses, because mm. that doesn't happen on a lot of shows across the board. I, I keep drinking a Marta Fernandez because it's, we would really, so much of this would not be here if it wasn't for her. Yeah, you were asking if we were pitching ourselves for this show? Or? Yeah, how did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I was a script coordinator at the time. Um, I was in a show that I liked at the time with a female showrunner, and I thought, you know, maybe potentially there's another female runner, and she happens to be Latinx, and she happens to be queer. So for me, it really started when I first saw the headline come out on Stars, um, and I saw that it was like, because they came out with like a Latinx queer showrunner, and I was like, oh my God, that's so badass. Like, honestly, I just need to meet this woman as a friend. Because like even in the show that I was currently in, I still I didn't have any Latina mentors, right? And that's was always an absence in every absence in every room that I had been in. Um, sometimes finding myself as the only woman, even as an assistant. And so I remember telling my friend Warren at the time he was a writer, and he I told him I was like, oh my god, I just I gotta meet this Latinx queer showrunner. Like, <laughs> can't believe there's someone out there. Like, I haven't even met another Latinx queer writer, let alone showrunner. And so he was like, dude, that's my homie. <laughs> <laughs> so Warren... We had uh, been on How to Get Away with Murder together. together. Yeah, so then he hooked it up. And I, I will always remember Tanya coming to the first meeting that we had. She had just had back surgery. And so she, she's like, meet me at the... We like went through like five different places to meet. But she was like, I need a certain like back chair because of my surgery. And she comes into the Starbucks with like literally like... A walker, walker, like just pushing it. And I'm like, oh my God, like who is this person? So I put her on my phone as like, I think it's a like badass queer Latina or something like that. There, were, there yeah. was no Latinx. Yeah, that was like this. <laughs> uh, and so we honestly, we, we developed a, a friendship, a relationship in which I was like, okay, well, hopefully, you know, if, if I can get anything out of this relationship, it's really some kind of mentorship and, you know, sharing really the the situations that we're sometimes in in rooms. Uh, but luckily, it turned into so much more because I, you know, I offered to read the script. I was very curious about what the script was. Um, and so I offered it to make it pretty and help with the so final draft. I don't draft, know, so. final draft. Yeah. So she was like, oh, let me help you. I was like, let me make it professional to stars. I've been on three star shows now as a script coordinator. I was like, let me make it pretty for you. And luckily, she said yes and gave me a chance. So thanks to her, you know, I'm here. And then, and then when, when you get your season two and you know that you have some spots to fill, obviously Gladys filled one of those spots, but how did, how did, that, how did you and Gladys meet up? Uh, we were in a Latina brunch group, right? Yeah, yeah um, so there's this group in Hollywood called, uh, I, I guess it's called the Latina, Latina Brunch TV Writers. Writers yeah, yeah, TV Writers Brunch Group, and it's a community of um, all Latina TV writers, and you know, nothing like that had existed. I've been in this industry since 02, and I really was kind of lost, and when I found this group in only like a few years ago, um, it was formed a few years ago, it was such a like breath of fresh air for me, because I was like, oh my God, there's more of us. And um, I met Tanya in that group, and we just became friends at first. So we were friends for like a couple years, or like a year before um, the first season of Vida. And we were kind of like, we would meet every like a few times a year or whatever, have coffee, talk just about our projects, and be like a mentorship. Um, and then um, season two came about, I wasn't available season one, but season two came about, and it was like no question, I really wanted to work on this show. and. She wanted to, she needed, you know, other Latina writers, and it was, it just worked out perfectly. Like, I think it was all meant to be. I think your um, deal closed in a day. Yeah. Right? It was like, yep, okay, we're doing this. Yeah, yeah, she was like, no, I don't need to read her. No, just get her in. And uh, it was, it's really been such an amazing experience because I've worked on so many shows that, you know, I'm the only Latina in the room. And just to walk into this room, which is all Latinx um, and majority of Latinas, it was just amazing because I feel like creatively I was able to um, let my guard down and not feel like you know I was limited on what cultural stories I wanted to tell and what stories about identity I wanted to tell. So it's, it's really a safe space 
And um, Tanya has created this amazing place for us, you know, and for us to tell our stories. And that's why I feel like the show is so authentic and it is what it is because we are not let, holding back. This is our only opportunity, not our only, hopefully. There'll be many more opportunities, but this is our first opportunity to tell uh, our stories on a show like this. So I'm really grateful to be on the show. So, so once you assemble the writer's room, like I know all writer's room, they all, they all kind of work differently, like how the showrunner actually runs the room, but how do you run your room? Will you help me? Just because I, I might also think I run it this way. You're like, no, you <laughs> Let's start are with a mess. Video. You're a hot mess. No, um, <laughs> we, we start, uh, well, we have couches, not a table, first yes. of all. This, this is, is very, a, I mean, it's a very more chic, but this is more chic. That we, it's pretty comfy, although yeah. this season, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if we fit with yeah. couches in there. But um, so we, we, there's couches, there's Palo Santo and incense that happens. Just so you know, I'm going to say this, and I sound so hokey. I just gave an interview, and when I read it, I was like, I sound crazy. <laughs> But I am not. I'm just spiritual. I, the day before the Monday, so the Sunday before the Monday that we start, I all, well, for this sh um, show, I had a mini room, Brujas, and the last two seasons of, of Vida, I bring my Bruja. Okay, my Senora, if you want, if that makes you feel more comfortable. The woman should do, like, she does, um, like three hours of stuff. She like cleans every corner, meaning uh, with you know sage and stuff and Palo Santo and other witchy things. Uh, and, and so she, you know, because uh, these are itinerant like places. So a lot of writers have been in there. A lot of broken dreams, you know, and and <laughs> lost hope. We don't want any of that. So apparently, I was hopeless. Remember, she you said. You were hopeless. You guys, I needed the break, and yeah. you know, <laughs> you were but she, uh, what was it? I had to put water in a fishbowl, and I had to have. the fairy. Yes, for the fairies, <laughs> fairy. so they could like <laughs> dance, I guess, in the water. I don't know. It's because it's a queer show. But so they fairies. were gonna bring me hope, and they yeah. did. Right, the fairies, fairies helped. queer show. Yeah. But it, it ha Remember, the fairy kept unplugging your thing, and it oh, did, yeah. they're she tricksters. Did that. That's that's she really was like, they're. This fairy is gonna take care of you, but this is sounding crazy now. <laughs> this is the process. We're all crazy but, um, then. But it, it's true, right? You have yeah. to tape it, and even taped so, the fairy. Yeah. So the fairy said, "I mean the the, the fairy." <laughs> Sabrina, no, the middle-aged witch of no, Studio no, City. Said that I was gonna have a good desk area, but that the fairies were gonna play with my cables. Like that, you know, like cables. And at that point there was nothing on the desk. It was an empty desk. I come with my laptop and I put my cable, but the desk has like a back to it. So in order for me to plug the computer, like I literally have to move the whole desk. And it's like a heavy, heavy desk. So I literally had to like climb behind it. And for whatever reason, like my, every time I unplugged it from my computer, the cable would go zoop. It would fall behind it. It's the it. fairy. <laughs> Anyway. The fairy was invited to this panel, by the way, but it was busy. <laughs> Couldn't no. make it. The no, best no. part of all is that yeah. our witch is named Sabrina. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. And, and so that is very important to me, to, for the space to feel right. And, and then we utilize those kinds of things when we're, like, like when we're getting stale. Remember the angel cards? We're like, let's say if your pitch is good. And then, <laughs> no. Kelly <laughs> <So like, laughs> was like, is this character going to dun, 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 like something big for the season? Yeah. And it would be like, well, let's ask the card. Let's ask the card. No, that, we're not going to do that. <laughs> Literally. I think we like, asked if Raul Castillo was going to get casted yes. multiple times. And it always said yes. I didn't yeah. want my dear friend Raul because I thought we were going to fight this like dogs. And, and this is being recorded. I, I love you, Raul. Because I just was like, because we're childhood friends. We're going to, so we're going to fight. And it always, and they were always pitching. And I was like, mm, blah, 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 blah. no. And then the cards always said, and sure enough, Raul Castillo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But so, oh, wait, oh, wait, your actual process. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Tangents are welcome. Tangents are okay. Yeah. But um, so like we have a ton of rolling boards and some and, and the and the walls are covered in boards, right? So when we first start, that first week is a lot of blue skying, and if you know what that means, it's like basically dreaming up things that could yeah. be, right? All of our we have like this board that's like all of our wish lists, but this show is a little different than I the shows I've been on because we want to say something with this show. <laughs> like what's the messages that we want? So like for instance, we want immigration to be like one of the topics and like colorism, one, colorism and yeah. you know. Uh, queer policing. Yeah, yeah. Queer what kind of queer sex scenes do you want to, so we dream up those. So we have that list, right? And then and then we make the list like what, what is your dream of it? Like it's a lot of dreaming until we start whittling, whittling no puedo decir la palabra. Like make, making it smaller. Whittling. Thank you. Whittling. Um, down and then and then the ro the rolling boards come out f by character, 
right? So it's like, so this season, what is Lynn's arc, right? So two or three people go off and they pitch something. Then we switch. You do Mari now in this group. So I get the most amount of ideas. Uh, and then we discuss those ideas. And then start stuff starts going on the board. And that's how we start putting together the season. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. That feels different than some of the rooms that I've been in because I feel like we end up doing a lot of the season break. And as we're doing the season break, we're obviously doing the character break. But in this show, we were just talking about that. Like, we really take a moment to do the character breaks. And then we actually do the season break. Right. Yeah, I just think it's because it's such a character-heavy show. And, you know, we always change our minds, too. Like, halfway through the season, we're like, maybe this is what Lynn should do. Mm -hmm. um, just because we get to know the characters a little more as the season goes on. But we always have kind of like, what is the character's end goal? Um, what is the drive for this season? What is the drive for this character in the season? Um, and I'm, for the most part, that stays. But we also change their like emotional trajectories sometimes. Um, but yeah, I, I think it starts off with dreaming up like what we want these characters to go through um, in the season. And then um, we have like, for instance, we had this one, the party episode. We always knew that with this episode, or sorry, in season two, there's like a big party episode. Um, and we knew that we wanted to do something special. Originally, it was like a road trip, and we wanted um, this to be like a different type of episode that we can kind of just break free and do something wild and fun. Um, so we always knew we wanted that episode, but uh, yeah, we just have these kind of ideas of which what goes into each episode, and Tanya just decides. And, and at the it, like we had an end in mind, so I knew right. that this season, big headline, Lynn wins, but she has to lose a lot and learn and to, before she wins. And that last moment, if you've seen it between them, Lynn wins, you know? Finally, she gets what she's always wanted. But it's not like the boy or the, you know, like money or something. It's like the validation from her sister, you know? Um, but that, the, the, we, we put their missions up on, on these boards and we kept going back. Is this episode supporting that? Even if they're getting lost, is it? part of the story to get to that win. Um, and Emma had her own, like, what it was, you know, and Maddie had her own, you know, and, and dear Eddie, poor Eddie, that gets no wins ever. <laughs> Pobrecita, but, you know. <laughs> Pobre. I feel she, but Seth is, Seth is such a good crier, though. So. All their emotional scenes, yeah. they nail them every yeah, single they time. Did. They did. Yeah. Um, do you, because the show is called groundbreaking, it's called convention busting, I think I've seen. And But do, are you guys aware of that in the room? Like when you were breaking season two, were you kind of thinking like, oh, we're doing things that nobody else is doing? Or did, was that, was that, could you not even go there and think about that not at the, the point? Not the first season. The first season we were like, I hope they pick this up. Because we, we actually were writing it before I got a green light. So we were like, ooh. It, it felt like even when we got it, like it always felt like a yellow light. Yeah. Like it always felt like there was a pilot presentation before there was a room, you know? There was, the, and obviously the pilot, and then there was like, we're writing some episodes, but we're not even sure if we're gonna go into production. So I think for the first season, yeah, it was a lot of like, we're not even sure. We're just hoping that, that some of this that's landing, that for us it's speaking volumes of our experience and our culture and the, the you know, things that have happened to us. We hope that it translates, that the execs understand it, and that it will somehow get picked up. So first season was all about trying. I think second season was obviously a different experience. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know how you but coming into this room, I knew we were doing something groundbreaking. I knew that there is no other room that I've been in that can talk about colorism in the Latinx community like we talked about colorism in this show. Like even saying the word prieto, even saying the word chingona is revolutionary in this industry. Um, and so I knew that I had walked into something like so different and every day that I walk into that room I'm, I just feel like a powerful chingona because I'm just like you know what are we how are we going to change culture today how are we going to change television and I, I think that's what this show is doing even if we've only been on for two seasons and I um at the panel earlier I shared a little of my doubts but um I starting second season I was very insecure and doubtful because, and they, they warn you, second season, you got that sophomore syndrome thing that where you just mess up or something. And I was like, not to me, it won't happen to me. And then it did, and it's it snuck in because I was reading all the positive reaction, especially from brown queers that were like, you have to do this. And I felt like a responsibility, we have to get it right. We have to get it so right, and that paralyzed me. And, and you, you all saw that, you know? 
Yeah, it definitely did. I mean, there was an added pressure of like all of a sudden it, for, it felt like the work was bigger than like yeah. the practical work that we're doing. You know, like it, it became more than a TV, TV show in that sense. Like if we leave this off, yeah. are we harming us as a community? I mean, it, it felt that yeah. big to me. You know, like and and um, I think I was getting crushed under the pressure. A lot of us were experiencing that in the room. You you just got there, you had the fresh vibe, you were like ready, but a lot of us were like, oh my God, the reaction was really good. You know? <laughs> like, it, that hun like that 100% on Rotten Tomato thing, it was <laughs> paralyzing, you know? And and we do become a family. Like I think a lot of shows say say that. I mean, I don't. I, I really felt it in this show, and the way we were, we acted in the room and behaved in the room was a lot like siblings. So like we, you know, we got into our little arguments, and we always got try to get over it. And it was. I think it was so much more infused by this level of emotion because it just the show just meant so much more for us, you know. Yeah, and I think you know, I think you kind of said something that was pinpointed how I was feeling is like the level of emotion and passion that we have for this show. And it's, you know, I don't know if, if you guys follow Tanya on Instagram or even me or Jen, but we are so passionate about like promoting this show just because what it means for our community to have something like this is so special. And so, yeah, we're going to get passionate about it in the room and we're going to, you know, argue and we're going to have opinions. And we have this thing called Marco Polo that we always, uh, that's another part of the process. Oh, yeah. I forgot. <laughs> oh, the virtual a, room. The, the virtual room, which it could be bad HR, y'all. <laughs> because, uh, because I start, I don't sleep that much. I wake up at four and I'm like, tick, 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 tick. And, um, and I start early, and we have Marco Polo, and if you know what it is, it's like video walkie-talkie, you should download it. I should get <laughs> stocks on it. And, um, but it helped me a lot during production when like, the costume designer was like, this one or this one? I'd be like, that one. And I could be over here on set, you know? So it was like great for that. But we started it in the writer's room, and I'd be like, 4 a.m., I'm gonna be kind and wait till 5 a.m. Okay, so I need three pitches for thicky, thicky, thicky. And, I don't say that you have to answer right away. <laughs> but Esty does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, then we have a writer that's like, whoop, right away, watching. She and she's like, it. here's three pitches. Tuk -a -tuk -a -tuk -a -tuk -a. Which, I don't know if that's awesome for people at 4 a.m., but ever, you know, thank you for playing along. Well, what I, what I think... I think we want to reply because we are, like I was saying, we're so passionate about the subject matter that it doesn't phase me to, like, I mean, I know, I don't know if that's healthy, but, <laughs> but it, you know, I feel like it's an honor to tell these stories, so I'm not even, like, tripping if, you know, we have to work a little later or work a little earlier than we should because we don't, ha this doesn't happen to us every day. And let's be honest, our room hours are so nice. We're there at 10 to 4. Yes, and that's <laughs> because hour lunch. So it's good That's balance. really nice so. for um, TV. Yeah. Where some of us have been at, like, yeah. 10 nine to, to nine. 12, 9 to 9. I mean, yeah. like, till some rooms are gone and go through the time. weekends, too. I know. Yeah. So it's really nice. I tried we, to not do weekends. We're very but I did efficient. Mark we get a lot of stuff yeah. done, so... Well, I want to go back to something you were talking about, and we talked about this on our on the podcast that we did, um, the TV Insider podcast. There's an interview I did with Tanya and Raul yeah. from TCA, um, and you talked about reactions on Twitter and things that you see, like the taco part from season one, the fact that some people were in uproar about the way... Was it Emma ate her taco? <laughs> But yes. then talk about that a little bit, because we, we also talked about the fact that, you know, how much do you let that come into your head when you're trying to write, when you're thinking about those reactions? See, like that, it did go in my head, because I was like, I was there when she was shooting. It was the first day of sh shooting, and I saw that, as a choice, she used Valentina, and she ate her taco like this. Like, like a sandwich. Like a sandwich. Like a sandwich. Yeah. I thought it was a choice about a girl that had been away from her culture, right? So I was like, okay, that makes sense. If you eat a taco correctly... You bring yourself to the taco, right? You go to she the taco. She didn't. So I was like, choice. You know? <laughs> Great. Oh, my God. Twitter blew up. It was like, mostly Mexicans. This, I don't want to watch the show. This girl can't even eat the taco, right? And I was like, but understand that it's a complicated, you know? And it was so, it really bugged me, right? But I feel like we addressed this season well, two. Well, because yeah. it really bugged the hell out of me. Uh, that every, we know how to eat tacos. Off, we, <laughs> like, we know how to eat, all of us know how to eat tacos. This was a choice, you know? So like, and I couldn't be on Twitter. We're like, well, excuse me, but actually, you know? Like, I couldn't be like, because I wanted to, because it would pop up every, like, when it stopped, it'd pop up every, like, week or so. Like, some guy would 
find the probably thread. probably my husband. Yeah, <laughs> he was like, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, like, I got into a fight with Raul about it, about Valentina. Why did she put Valentina in the taco? I was like, I am going to answer this second season. <laughs> and we did. And I was like, I'm going to give it an emotional thing. Like, this yeah. is why now, you know. But and poor, poor um, Mish, the girl who plays Emma, she took a, some burnt, like, people would come up and be like, do you know how to eat a taco? <laughs> poor girl! <laughs> you know? So so going back, though, how, how moving forward as more people are watching the show and more people are commenting, how do you keep that out of your head so it doesn't really influence where you might be going? Because sometimes it can get in the way. You know what's in my head right now? I'm nervous about next season's sex scenes. Because I feel like we did such a good job, and I said everything I wanted to say, and I'm like, oh shoot, what what else? You know, like how are how they? Do we escalate. Yeah, because now it has to be how like, well, you open with a, a the world's saddest orgy. How do you top that? <laughs> so I need to stop that, but I haven't yet. Right now, I'm still in the worry stage. When we get in the room, it'll be like active, like, you know, what? Because no sex scene is. Um, Gratuitous. Everything has a purpose, and it's a uh, character-based. You know, everything. Um, so I have to go back to that. But right now, I'm like, oh. like how? I don't know. Like, We're any have to watch ideas? A lot of porn. <laughs> <laughs> the, the truth of the matter is, I don't know if we stop listening. Like, I, I think we yeah. do listen, and I think there's a there is a choice through the process of like, how much are we gonna want to answer that versus the other? Uh, but yeah, I don't think we ever like. Which zero. other people don't like? I've been. Um, I just did that showrunner panel, and they're like, why are you listening to Twitter? And I'm like, I don't know. It feels feels like a responsibility in in a way, which is not a good way to build a TV show. Do you know what I mean? You should just build the TV show you want. But I don't know. I feel It does feel like this is a political act, getting to put these brown bodies on the screen. So it's like there's an added responsibility, you know? How, how much discussion went into, and this might be season one and two, just about the queerness of the show and how much you would explain and dig into and then you have a character like Emma that doesn't want to be defined and we see a lot of different actions that she does that would be like somebody else might make that into a whole story point the fact that she's you know with Baco and then Nico and all that stuff you know can you talk about that a little bit because those are choices you guys are making and some shows would lean into that a lot more as far as explaining it but instead we don't it's explain part of, stuff. it's part of the world yeah, yeah. like we don't we should, they're just lived they're just living their experience, you know? Yeah, even that queer conversation that happens in season two, I mean, the characters start talking about what they, you know, their view on it, but like, we're not really explaining a lot of what those terms mean or anything. We, so I get that, so I came into, first season, I was like, I wanna do the tourist conversation because I get called a tourist all the damn time, and I wanna do it, there was no room. And, and this season, I was like, we are gonna do the tourist. Tourists, well, have you seen the show? Yeah. And I was like, let's do it. And then it engendered a, a polemic conversation in the room, you know, about tourism, which enraged me in a good way, so that we, all those points of views are sort of in there. It's yeah. like the room is a little bit that table, you know? Yeah, we were pretty vulnerable of like what we've been called and also what potentially we called other people. And like, it was a pretty open conversation, I think, for, for a while. And it led to that scene. But I think it's leading to a lot of story beyond that, too. How, how much of those conversations that you guys have changes things? Because you might have an arc planned out or you might know where stories are going, but just a conversation that could start out of nothing all of a sudden might make you think, hey, what if we went that way with this story instead? Does that happen often? No, it just enhances it. Yeah. It doesn't change it or divert it. It hands, enhances it. I think it layers whatever, yeah. especially specific moments like yeah. in the scene. Well, like the condom and the vibrator. That was a few days of... A polemic in that room. Um, I just wouldn't share toys, okay? So if I'm not sharing toys, I don't woman. need condoms. But if you're sharing uh, toys, I totally. And I'm like, it. what if you're playing the field? Wait, hold on. Like, and it, but there's there were two married uh, lesbian couples in the room, and like basically a le Esty and, and her partner is basically there. But so I was like, hold on, this is not the demographic, maybe married ladies, you know? Um, so like we, we, it was, but but the conversation could only be had in a room that has that many queer Latina women in it, you know? And I was like, we're gonna do the condom and then see what happens. And the reaction has been super positive. Yeah. yeah. But I, I'm glad we did it, because it was that, that person does do that. It was perfect for the character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I love that you stopped listening to us and you took it to Facebook. And <laughs> oh, sorry, I did. Yeah. I will so do that. Sometimes the whole room will like, no, no. Yeah, so like, 
so like they all disagree with me and I'm like, okay. And then, hello, my lesbian friends. Uh, digga, 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 the question. And then, but like comment after comment of like, of course, if you're just, you know, being active, sexually active, I'm like, boom, see? So we're gonna do it. Well, what I think is really cool about that scene is like there's such specificity to it that like, I think that's what makes our show a little different because yeah, that is like such a specific thing that queer people, not everybody could relate to it, but some people can. Um, and you know, every little moment is, we have to find a lot of special moments um, throughout the show that are very specific, not just to our community, but to our, the queer but community. But even, <laughs> but queer femmes and queer, um, it depends what kind of queer, because I had to explain it to my gay male friend. And also I had to explain, uh, why did she wash her hands? Because she's about to have sex. Yeah. Sex? In the, I was oh, not right. the gay male friend that asked no. that. No! <laughs> it was not me. I was like, she's about, oh, you're not, yeah, okay. But also she was just out there by the trash. That's why. I mean, right. and it's Nico. Nico is kind of watching, you know. But that whole moment was, um, you know, and even my producers were like, I think you could cut out of the scene a little bit before the wa washing of the hands. I'm like, wait, that is code for us. Like. Yeah. Those moments, the condom, that, um, it, it's code, and that's meant for us, you know? But that goes back to having that team working behind the scenes. They, they get that. Yeah. You don't have to explain over and over mm -hmm. to somebody. Right. Yeah. Wow. Um, do, do you hear ever, you can't do that, or that's too far, or, and I'm not even talking about sex, just emotionally, I, anything. Well, I don't feel like sex we've ever, in fact, with Mari, they're, they're like, go ahead, more. I was like, but she's a virgin, okay. Um, no, I think one time we got told not to do this, the road trip thing, but I think it was story, not, it was just story. It was like, no, you're not there yet. It's season two, don't leave the neighborhood, you know? But we secretly did to that party, because that's basically like leaving the neighborhood, you know? Um, so, but not really. I mean, at least these past two years when Marta was there, and Marta's, Marta Fernandez, drinking game, um, um, she's gone now, so I don't know how it'll be. We'll see. <laughs> I, just had, I just had a question that left my head, but um, oh. it'll come back. Sex. Uh, <laughs> no? Oh, I know what it was. Cause, um, <laughs> but it's not about sex. Well, I guess it, it may be kind of sort of. But when, for season two, when you brought in new characters, you brought in Nico, Baco, and... Dream girl Nico. Yeah. But when you bring those people in, how do you create? How do you, as a room, create those characters? Is it about like what will this character bring for one of our regular people, regular characters, or is it more about we need this voice in there now so Nico can satisfy that? Or how did you go about that in the room? Well, um, the short. So, so we couldn't end. Nico, I mean, sorry, Cruz and Emma couldn't be together. Emma wasn't there after six, like after two weeks. That's what around the time that two, the first season took. You know, and people, some people were like, oh, I want Nico. No, Emma's not there. She's never, you know. So we knew we had to see that and, and then grow something, you know, realistically. And I, don't, I still don't even know what will happen with Emma and Nico because Emma is a hot mess, you know, um, in, in that way. Of, uh, and, and that's the show, too. So they can't get it right right away because it's real, you know. Um, so we knew that Nico, and then I was like, I want the perfect girl, my perfect girl. <laughs> and then also I'd worked with Roberta Colindres, who plays Nico, in theater. She'd been in a play of My Mala Yerba and a Sundance uh, thing. And I just kept talking about Roberta, right? I was like, it's Roberta. So we wrote it for Roberta, even before Roberta knew. Um, so, and then thank God she said yes. Um, and, and that's, you know, there's not a lot of um, out Latina queers, too. And so we have like an iconic one from like Fun Home and I Love Dick and um, and then Baco, we wanted a hyper, we knew we wanted a hyper masculine energy for Emma to see how she, also we wanted to show what type of queer she was, you know? Uh, so that the tourist thing can make sense to, it's not just presentation, is that she, you've seen her now with a non-binary person who you could consider trans. Um, and you've seen her now with a um, cis male and with cis female. So like you see, oh, that's how Emma gets down, you know? Um, so that that was important, and then who else? Did we, oh, Rudy. Oh, Rudy. Yeah, we went. Well, um, we needed a politician in this. This was about gentrification. Yeah. 
you know, right now we just introduce them, but we'll see what we do with them. And also, Lynn was on a fast, so That's we right. needed, we, well, from from uh, Johnny, not necessarily from everybody. Well, she, she, At first. she At fell first. into it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we needed something <laughs> for for Lynn and Rudy. And they're so like pretty together, um, Rudy and, and Lynn, but like also like, yeah, maybe you still like want her with Johnny. But I think just to talk about a little bit um, how you phrase that question, it, I, part of it was like that we wanted things for the characters, but I think also one thing that we did was we really tried to shape those characters as much as possible, so they really became pretty complex and rounded the, themselves. That I feel like added this extra layer to those scenes and those things that were happening. Like, I, like Nico really does feel like, you know, one of the leads, like because it, she, that character's not just coming in to service Emma. Like, it feels like. That scene is coming to service Emma, but she's still super rounded and co complete. You know? And Roberto's fantastic too. So it's like you add that energy, that ease into the show, and then you add hi Raul's hyper masculine, like ex cholo thing. And like you start to have a really rich world. Then you add like CrossFit boy um, thing. And then Marco too, gender queer, you know, um, gender fluid. Um, guy that's that you know so like the world i'm excited about third season like who what what will that addition be you know and i think also with nico just to add um she added like the new queerness as opposed to eddie who is like it's such the juxtaposition of their two different politics and their two different views on the world um and so that scene in episode seven where in t season two where nico kind of helps um eddie when she has her breakdown in the car I, I think we did discussed in the room of like, and I don't know if all of it made it, but how Eddie was feeling some type of way, kind of erased and you know not included in the in the bar situation because Emma was like not including her, and she felt a certain type of way towards Nico, but the fact that the uh, Nico ended up helping and coming to um, Emma Eddie in that very vulnerable time, it was kind of like bringing those two factions together is like the, the new queerness and the, the old queerness. So I, I, I really think that Nico was also service for Eddie in, in, the, in the show. So. Yeah. Did you guys all like the Nico character this season? Yes. Right? I, w I, would, I was binging season two and I was texting Jen. Jen's my neighbor. So I was texting her saying like, do they get together? Don't tell me if they get together. Is it gonna happen soon? And like you're gonna have to wait. I know, but and I got there quick because I, I couldn't stop watching the episodes. That's just my own story. Um, talk about the, we won't go into the details of the season two finale too much because I don't want to spoil it for people I haven't seen, but at the time you didn't know if a season three would happen, right? Yeah. So did, we was, didn't know till last week. Yeah. Legit, so there, we were, there, were there a lot of talks about like, what if this is the series finale? How do we kind of put a pin on it? Or did you not, were you just being hopeful and thinking like, let's not do that? There were not talks, but we, uh, both seasons were like, well, this could end with the sisters uh, on the rooftop season one. And that would be, we would be happy with that. I mean, not happy, but we would be proud of that ending. And the same thing with this one. If, if the validation is what you got from these two seasons, then fine. But um, we got more story to tell. We do, you know. What's going to happen between Emma and Nico? I, I think personally, I was just hoping that it was not the end. So I never was thinking that that was like, would be the complete end of the story. Uh, but I think even like in a show like this, like it, it just feels like it would never end because it feels so real and grounded that like you would imagine like what yeah. happens and with like the characters. New happen. characters could come in. Yeah. yeah. It's a rich world. I mean, we've discussed like different places where we could take it in season three. And we actually had like uh, in the middle of the season, we're like, what if we can stretch this out to like six seasons or something? <laughs> and we even have like ideas for each. Um, so, you know, there's always like hope that, you know, who knows what will happen. But um, we definitely, it's such a rich world that there's so many stories that we could tell. Well, and speaking of that, can you each, I'll go to each of you to talk about a particular moment of season two that is, or could also be season one, but that was like really important that you get that in there, whether it was a moment that you had or that you knew of. Whoever wants to go first. Well, um, Eddie convalescing was very, like you said, um, about me and the walker. I was six months in a bed without being able to really walk um, because of these surgeries, and I almost died, and it was like real. Um, and the convalescing is the hard work. It wasn't like surviving the surgery. It was like, who's going to take me to the bathroom? Who's going to help me shower? That kind of thing, you know? So I really, I wanted to see if like, 
you know, how, how it is without all the money in the world for a caretaker. And, and that was important to me. And um, said, said the actor that um, uh, realiza Eddie. Oh my God, I'm very bi uh, bilingual right now. That is Eddie. Um, uh, they, they are non-binary, that's why I refer to them as they. Um, I would work with them. Um, on the physicality, just be like you wouldn't hold yourself like that. You would, you know, you'd hold yourself like this, and that was a very important storyline for me, just to be, to get right, you know. Okay. I think probably for the entire two seasons, but I, I think we were able to delve into it a little bit more. Season two, one of the storylines that I'm that I feel responsibility over, I guess, is the sort of the activism, you know, characters like. Um, so my wife and I actually met on this journey that she took across the country where she walked from San Francisco to Washington, D.C. for immigrant rights. And so... She's here. During, She's yeah, we'll call her out and make yeah. her embarrass her. But, um, <laughs> but she, you know, as, as knowing someone who, who did that kind of journey, who was really involved in activism, um, being sometimes part of protests and situations like that. And, and I, what I realized is, like, in those situations, the emotions are really high because you do feel like you're doing something that's bigger than yourself when you're an activist. Like, in it, those issues are sort of, are, are sometimes really life and death, you know? Um, and so I just wanted to make sure we were portraying, like, the characters and that viewpoint um, as close as possible to what the reality could be. We, I feel like Mary, Mari, what did I say Mary? See, now I'm trying to be, like, all American over here. Because you're in Texas, girl. Maybe that's why. In Mari's case, I feel like Mari is not totally a fully formed, like, she's not, like, the super, super chingona. Like, I think Yoli is there with activism. She's a chingona in training. She's in training, yeah. yeah. And so, so you, you see Mari in, in a situation this season where she's kind of navigating these both worlds. Like she's coming into the sister's world out of necessity, really, and she needs a job, but she also wants to stay true to her values. And so um, that was just being able to like talk about the protest, being able to define those characters like Yoli and make sure that they felt authentic and real was at least really important for me. And we broke a lot of stuff for that that didn't end up getting in there because it's half an hour. So we didn't, but it was a, yeah. But I'm glad we did the protest because the protest we had originally, that was our, really our fantasy, at least my fantasy, yeah. for the end of season one. Yeah. And we just weren't there yet. So, I mean, it was only six episodes. So I'm so happy that we got to do it season two. Um, I guess my story this season was the Mari getting kicked out of her house um, after she, uh, after um, Johnny shows uh, Mr. Sanchez the video. Um, and, you know, when I, that was actually something that, something similar happened to me when I was a kid. And so I was, I really felt important to tell a story of like um, a Mexican dad and like how they react and they, and how they treat their sons differently than their daughters. And, you know, that conversation of like how, how unfair it is, you know, that they don't even see you as the victim but you were caught in a sexual act. Even he, they don't even care about the details of you know what surrounded that. But you did something wrong, um, and I think um, we took Mari in this very into this very vulnerable place. And you know she's still very like young and experimenting with whatever you know sexuality she did this season. Um, and so to have her father turn away from her, she doesn't have a lot of family. Her mom's not there. Um, it was such a like an emotional gut punch um, to the character, and I think you know it does something to Johnny's character too. So I'm really glad that we were able to tell that story of like the unfairness <laughs> between you know how both uh, siblings machismo. were treated. Yeah. yeah, the machismo. So yeah, great. Um, do you guys have questions? Should we do a Q and A portion? I think we do. There's, There's a, a mic, mic here. I'm assuming we can use the mic. Nobody told me if we were doing Q and A, so let's just let's do it. So if you have questions, come up, line up at the mic, and go go right ahead. Hi, um, I I just want to say that after I saw the pilot and I saw the credits, I just got so emotional because I just graduated from UT for RTF. Congratulations! So thank you. Um, I found in my undergraduate work, I did a lot of Latinx stories, and I had a lot of pressure to not fall into the stereotypes. So I was just wondering if that's something that you guys have to talk about or you worry about, because I was scared it was my fear, not anybody else's. We have, we've had conversations about it, but it, we don't, we're, don't guide ourselves through that because we just stay true to the character. But I, I don't think we let ourselves be guided no, by that. No, I mean, like, with the creation of Baco, like, you know, we were, like, very careful not to make him, like, the traditional 
East LA Cholo, you know, and he brought so much to that that role, and also the writing. We were very, I think, intentional of not making him like, you know, the typical stereotype that you see on television. Um, but I think also that the the character, the actor himself, brought this like richness to that role. So, I mean. Yes, we're kind of intentional, but also no. I don't know if that's like, I, sorry to confuse you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that one thing that happens is that on TV, what you're usually seeing is one side of a coin, right? Or even like a sliver of it. And so that becomes a stereotype. So when you're only seeing Latina women as this like a super passionate sexual, sexualized character is like, that could be a stereotype, right? I think the opportunity that we have on a show like this where we have so many Latinx characters is that we can really tell a range of stories. even. And we try to tell a range of story with each character. So we, we talk about the stereotype, but then we layer it in with so much that like you're seeing way beyond that. Oh, that's a really good point, is that I feel like when you do see the stereotypes, they're, they don't have layers to them. Like, you just see this person, and they usually don't have a backstory, and that's because of who's telling the story. Um, but because we are telling the story, we have given those people dimensions, and our characters all have something. And I think that's what makes it not stereotype. Yeah. Yeah, I think first season, um, when they saw the trailer, they were like, oh, there's a cholita, you know, she's, she's a chola, and then there's a bougie coconut, and then there's like that. And then you see it, you're like, wait, she's not a chola at all. Just because she wears, what do you think a chola looks like? You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and so that, that's, that's been exciting, too, to be like, oh. And then same thing with Eddie. You, we haven't seen a, um, a masculine of center brown dyke l like that. And you think usually that they're like the um, comic relief or like some kind of violence, you know, like they might, or, you know, some, it, they're two dimensional characters. But she's the heart of our show, Eddie. So, like that already, you like the way we position the characters, they can't, I feel like they can't be stereotypes. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Thanks Thank for the question. You. Thank you. So, what, sorry. I wrote my college thesis 10 years ago about Latina stereotypes in pop culture, so you basically answered what I was gonna ask. Um, so I'm pivoting. Um, I feel like all your all the first, first loves in this um, show are, are like kind of asses. Is that on purpose because of personal experience? Or like, <laughs> I mean, they're not necessarily like the first love that you yeah. tend to see in, in pop culture. That makes sense. I, I think um, on Vida we try to tell very, very complicated characters, and so that's someone that like e even with the sisters sometimes like you, people question like why should I like them, you know? Like, and we're trying to be able to tell stories where we can push the envelope and we can just tell rounded out characters that are going to do things that you're not always going to agree with. So for us, it was like I mean, it's just great for conflict. I I d I'd never care about the likability of a character, are they compelling? And let's say if we take Lynn and Johnny, I hope they're compelling to watch because that is, they're messy and you can't tell me necessarily that he's all bad because he does this one bad thing. Um, same thing with Lynn, you know, and as she's trying to, so I, I love that they're, not, I don't know, I don't think they're all bad. Is it because Cruz said that thing about the thing? Yeah. Well, that was, also she was drunk. It's all complicated. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And last thought, the music is absolutely yes. incredible on the show. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we question. worked with um, we worked with uh, Pulse is a, a record label, and we worked with eleven uh, female artists and nine of them Latina. And I went scene by scene in uh, for six of the episodes, and they wrote the music for the, that's why it's so perfect. Nice. And they're Latina, like they get it, you know. You can, uh, it's on Spotify. The, the playlist of every song in the series is on Spotify. Yeah. Hi. Hi, I'm Janelle. Hi, Janelle. Uh, Vita season two is perfect season of television for me, so thank you. Um, and I'm a big shipper, just as a television viewer, and so Nico and Emma yes. oh, they're really get it me there. Emiko. Emiko, perfect. <laughs> that's the, the, that's hashtag. the hashtag, yeah. Um, Remember it was Crema? No, it's Emiko. <laughs> Lynn and Rudy would be Ludi. <laughs> Yikes. Um, but I think that the relationship that captures my attention most is the sisters. I'm here at ATX with my sisters. 
Um, yes, and so I'm wondering, um, I mean, you talked about that last scene and that was so powerful, just how Emma doesn't even like reach out to embrace, she just lets Lynn have this moment and like be emotional and, you know, get her win. Um, so I'm wondering about that process for you all, what sisterhood means and kind of maybe if there's, if you have sisters, if that's something that, or how that came about for, for the script. Do you all have sisters? Yeah, mine is Melanie? sitting right here. Yeah, I, she makes all my earrings, including La Chincha's earrings when she gets down with Tlaloc. Those big chingona earrings, she made those. My mom crocheted them and she, she made them. Um, I, I have a very complicated relationship with one of my sisters. We don't have, a, um, como se, like, connect, uh, um, yeah, like, I can't, I don't have access to her. Uh, yeah, we're estranged. And then I do have a great relationship with my other sister. So, um, but family's messy and we all, I mean, we can talk about it. We all in that room have at least one family member that we have a very flawed relationship with and that goes in there, you know? Yeah, I feel like everybody has, we talk a lot about mommy, daddy, sister issues, sibling issues in this room and I feel like every, I think everyone has that, you know? But I feel like in this room in particular, we are a family show, uh, not a family show, we're a family <laughs> drama. Yeah. Um, a different type of family. Yeah, when I kept telling people, we're a family show, and they're not like, forever. you're not. <laughs> yeah. But I think, I don't have any sisters, I have brothers only, but, you know, like, I, I'm kind of estranged with, like, a couple of them, um, but I feel like we all bring that, those issues that we have that we want to talk about and just lay it out on the table and make it messy. That is all in the DNA of the show. Yeah, thank you. Hi there. Well, I don't really have a question, but I was afraid they were going to sneak y'all back into that black curtain right <laughs> after this was done. And I got y'all uh, two marigolds each, and I wanted to get <gasps> Oh, that's cute. Marigolds. Bring them up real fast so we don't lose time. Right. Come For on. Day of Thank the Dead. But it's not Day of the That's very sweet. Thank, Thank you so much. And orange. We're supposed to be wearing orange. Yes. Thank you. That's right. For anti gun Thank so you. Nice. Very yeah. sweet. Thank you. Ne I mean, next question. Here. Uh, I just have to say I thought this was the most natural panel I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, you three flow so well together and you all add so many great tidbits and details. And specifically for Tanya, you've been called a mentor multiple times. I was wondering if that just came naturally to you or if you know, letting other people talk about your original you know, baby, <laughs> uh, your creation, did you have to hone those skills or is that something that lifting up other people and involving other people, does that come naturally to you? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because she doesn't see herself as a mentor. <laughs> so so but, Tanya like, is. is now, what I've realized is like, we've we are such close friends. Like we really become friends and I think that's how she sees it. I think that's why yeah. you got comfortable. But I have to say, as a, as a queer Latina coming up in the industry, especially like from the assistant level, it was really hard to find those voices that I could say like, where, you know, they were a few years ahead of me. Like if she already had her own show, you know? And so for me, that's why I call it mentorship because I felt like even if she wasn't sitting there to be like, here, come with me and let me teach you how it is. She was like, oh, I'm going to this meeting. Like, come join me. And like, and so she was doing it without actually putting the label of mentorship on it. I think you're like a little bit allergic to the mentorship label. Um, <laughs> I say that, I think, from like more than what traditionally people would think about as mentorship. But I think really what the beauty of it is that like it's just very organically become a friendship um, for us. And I think for everyone that has, the, a lot of people say, like, we've got her first. Like, yeah. the, um, the woman who's crying because she just had her first release on the show of a, of a song. Yes. Like, for, for a lot of us, it's like, this is our first, you know? Um, and that's something that Tanya has done by being able to like make a show and stand very firm in her ideals of like I am going to make it and I want to make it with these people and I want to give these people opportunities. So it's the, it's not lip service. I oh, wait. I'm starting to itch. Hold on. It's not lip service that um, I want all the, my writers to be showrunners. Like it's not that's real. And I hope you think I'm supporting you in that because if something is happening, you know, I want to be like, how can we do this? Um, together, what can I, how can I help? Um, but not just that, the directors, the, um, and the actors too. So it's, it's, um, it's important to open these doors because I don't know how long they'll let me open them and that's real because we've been in cycles in this, in this town. We're not in that town, in that <laughs> town, in Hollywood with a capital H. Um, that town has like, remember there was Kane and then Kane went away, right? Then there was one day at a time and that right now we don't know what's happening with day at a time, you know, so like it's like, um, we make 
progress we take a step forward and then it goes back so i don't know while while i can hold the door open like hodor no he held it he held it close he held it close he held it close i, I hold it open like just come through you know it does feel like ur an urgent thing yeah, yeah. Okay. and i think just quickly um for mentorship yeah i know you're allergic to that title but like i've like i've been in this industry for a long time but i've never had that until i met tanya really and um it was like, oh, like I could ask her anything, and I don't feel like embarrassed to be like, I don't know, wh what does a manager do? Like, what does an agent do? I don't know, you know, those type of questions. Um, even though I have had so many years, no one was ever willing to mentor me. Um, and so, not until Tani came around, and now, you know, I'm hoping to pay that forward with like mentoring like Jen or whoever, you know. So, it is kind of like a family, and I think that's why the naturalness comes out. So. Okay, thanks. We have time for one more, I think. So. Quickly, please. Cool. Um, I'm Rachel. Janelle's my sister. We obviously Hi. get the messy family. I'm white. She's not. Um, I wrote down my question just so I wouldn't forget it. Um, I'm a high school English teacher, and I'm constantly fighting for more representation in my classroom And because uh, there's so many important narratives past the canon, which we're often told to teach in English classrooms. Um, are there any stories that have portrayed the intersectionality that's present in Vida or that represent your Latinx community or your identity in general that we can bring into classrooms that have been important to you or have influenced the show? I know, so hard question at the end. I'm yeah. so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, I, as a playwright, I did an adaptation of The House on Mango Street. I don't know yes. if you've read it yet. Oh, of course. My, um, my school did it this year as a play. Okay. Oh, oh. fantastic. <laughs> Not my play. Because, uh, <laughs> we'll do yours too. She doesn't let me. <laughs> she didn't like it. <laughs> um, <laughs> But that's still a very important in the canon, but you already know that. Um, uh. Well, I was just interviewed by a high school student for the show uh, last week, and they felt like they've never seen the colorism thing talked about on, mm -hmm. on television. And even though maybe the show isn't for high school students, um, she saw it and she was like, I was really drawn to that because she was a darker skinned girl in a very white family, and like she was called the P word, um, which is Prieta in her whole life and you know that was something she's writing a report on it and you know for s us to like be able to say something with, you know i think sh that is like a really good talking about colorism and having that conversation could be really great in in the classroom so is gloria know. saldua too like is it too early to like for a bridge called my back i don't know Never i'm not it. good i'm <laughs> i'm not Good at do I, I think I read that in, when in I was high school? senior. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think it's too early. Okay. 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 Thank you. Right. Thank you. you. You guys, I'm so sorry we have to wrap up. I'm sorry for the last few people. Yeah. But you guys, thank you so much for being thank here. You. And thanks to Tanya and Jen Yay. and Gladys. Thank you. <laughs>